Uh, thanks everybody for coming here. Um, yeah, we got a great turnout. It's got it's kind of cool. I get to see a whole bunch of friends I haven't seen for a long, long time. Oh, we just have a guest join us. Gary, how you doing, man? Dave and Alice, all the way over in Malaysia. My goodness. Um, yeah, it's great. Um, yeah, I appreciate you guys all showing up and being here. Um, I think we're just about getting ready to go here. So again, uh, I think Chelsea's giving you all the update on how this all works and how we're going to do this. And so we're going to keep questions, try to keep questions to the end, just because we got so many people here. There's almost 200 of you online right now. So we want to try to keep that, uh, kind of keep some level of control. Um, so let's see if we can do this. So what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk a lot about natural gas plants and optimizing condensate stabilizers. Um, a little bit about kind of the, how the plant process works and then a bit about how we can do some analytical measurements. So although we're going to be talking about hardware like condensate stabilizers and big operating vessels and facilities, we're going to spend some time talking about analyzers and analytical met methods too. Um, you know, a big thing what we like to do on, when we're looking at processing is saying, how can we make an analytical measurement that's going to provide some added value to the facility? And this optimization thing is, of course, important right now. It's always important, but with lower prices and some of the difficulties that are going on, it sure makes it a lot easier um, if we have a, a, a way of trying to improve production and yields. We see a lot of movies, they start off with like a, a, a prelude, what happened, you know, seven years ago or whatever. So we want to talk about what happened 240 million years ago. 240 million years ago, all the continents were together. It's kind of a cool little map. It shows us that, you know, we've got China up here, and here's Canada over here in the U.S., and everything was connected together, one gigantic continent. And on this continent that time, this is a, the middle of the Permian, and life is thriving everywhere. Oceans are full of it, plant life and vegetation. It's actually before the dinosaurs. And despite the fact that there were no automobiles and no people there, and all resources were renewable, there was actually a huge global warming event that occurred. And they refer to it as the great dying. 90% of life on Earth died between the end of the Permian and the beginning of the Triassic periods. And what that resulted in is all of this organic matter being deposited. And organic matter of any kind is, is really like bottled sunlight. I mean, solar energy comes in, plants grow, things eat plants, things grow, and that's where all these hydrocarbons come from. So 240 million years ago, all these hydrocarbons get laid down, and then the earth does its thing. It starts to move. Plate tectonics take and, uh, uh, start to affect things. Everything moves by about two inches a year. But over 250 year, million years, it spreads all these things out. And as they do, things on the surface get subducted. They move down under the ground and they get hot and under pressure and all those hydrocarbons turn into the things that we look for now, gas and oil. So all these continents moved around and we still ended up with a little spot up on the northeastern part of British Columbia, uh, or northwestern part of uh, northeastern part of Alberta, northwestern part of British Columbia, referred to as the Montney. And it's a big deposit that of hydrocarbons that were put down 250 million years ago. And that Montney gas resource is huge. A lot of people don't realize exactly how big it is. And if the resource is in place, so we're talking about 150 trillion cubic meters of gas, 288, 28 billion cubic meters of natural gas liquids, 38 billion cubic meters of oil. It's a world-class resource. It's bigger than the Permian, has as much gas as Qatar. Qatar is the largest natural gas shipper in the world of LNGs. So this is an amazing resource that's right here in Canada. People often think about it as a new resource because we only started drilling it extensively recently because it's a shale plate. This stuff is tight and tight rock, hard to get it out. But the first wells there were actually drilled by Texaco down at Buick Creek, just right by the Hamlet of Montney. It's where this whole thing actually got its name. Um, so this is a, a, a play that's been in production for a long time. 
But until we had horizontal fracturing and some of the new technologies that came out, it wasn't really an easily producible thing. That all changed 10 years ago or so. And what came out of that was these numbers of facilities that were put in up at Dawson Creek. A pretty amazing thing when the largest gas processing facility built for 30 years suddenly comes along to capture the abilities of a brand new play. And so three plants went in, three gas plants, towered at 200 million cubic feet a day, Saturn at 400 million cubic feet a day, Sunrise at 400 million cubic feet a day, and they produced so much natural gas liquids that they put in two large liquid separation hubs. So in total, this is a billion cubic feet of gas a day and tens of thousands of cubic meters of condensate and NGLs. So this huge play comes in and the people who are looking at putting it into play at getting the system up and running say, okay, but how do we do this optimally? How do we make it so we produce as much of those liquids because those are the things that make us money? And it's interesting because Gary Fraser's on this call right now. I know Anne uh, McRae was registered to come in, but I don't see her, but they were both at engineering companies or an engineering company was involved with this. We had a number of people from Solaris MCI. Solaris was involved in all of this. Um, this was a, a huge construction project and a major set of facilities that were built. So they want to know well, how are we going to process this gas optimally? And so when we think about natural gas processing really simplistically, we can look at it as we bring in inlet gas. We have some natural gas that comes into the system and it's got a variety of components in it. Obviously it's got a lot of methane, but it's got other things in it like propanes and butanes. And especially in the Montney, there's a lot of heavy stuff in there. There's a lot of C5, C6, C8, C12, heavier hydrocarbons. So when this natural gas comes in, we try to separate it to bring off a, a gas phase portion of it, and we let the liquids go off to be processed. And this might go into a cold absorber like a, with a rich and lean solvent that we use to separate. There's a number of ways we can do this. You'll often see propane cooling on these things. And what we'll do is we'll take the gas that comes in and try to make natural gas liquids as an outlet product. They're worth a lot more money. And so we put separation processes in place to say the fluid that's coming in or the gas that's coming in has stuff in it that I can sell as gas, but it has this more valuable product that I want to extract and bring it out as liquids. So, let me go back here. On the liquid side, we usually look at things like a C3 plus uh, uh, stream, which is, you know, is propanes and up, right? And we often refer to that as NGL. And then we look at a C5 plus stream, and we often refer to this as condensate. So we typically will separate this out into two different pieces, if you like. Well, three. We have the gas that goes off as sales gas. We have a C3 plus liquid stream and a C5 plus liquid stream. The highest value product for the longest time has been condensate itself, especially in Canada. Um, we, because of uh, the production of the oil sands and bitumen, bitumen is really thick and heavy and doesn't flow down pipelines well. And so the way we get it to flow is we dilute it with condensate. We put this pentanes plus stream into it and it makes the bitumen willing to flow. So we have a huge market there for Condi. In fact, the market got so big that we took one of the pipelines that went down to the US and used to take oil down to refineries in the Chicago area and changed the direction of flow so they can send Condi back up to us. And so the demand for condensate in Canada continues to grow and it's going to continue to grow as we continue to produce the oil sands. And we don't have enough of it. It means there's a market for it. It means we'd like to be able to produce more. So we got to think about what goes on inside of a gas plant. And really what we have is we have stuff that comes in from the field and 
it flows into a first vessel that's often referred to as an inlet separator. Sometimes it's called a three-phase separator. And it's a really simple concept. You know, like if I had my water bottle here, I must have said I do. Be right back. Now, if I've got a big processing vessel and I put in some gas and it's got some liquids, they're going to go to the bottom. And water is heavier than hydrocarbon liquids. So if there was a mixture of gas, oil, and water, it naturally, if I let it sit in this bottle, it would just naturally separate. Water goes to the bottom, hydrocarbons stay on the middle part above the water, gas goes up at the top. So we bring the fluid inside of an, into an inlet separator. We let it spend some residence time in there and it naturally starts to settle up. And we take water off the bottom leg of that inlet separator. There's usually a weir in here that says, okay, I'll keep all the water on this side. The condensates or the natural gas liquids flow over onto this side and the gas goes out the top. We may compress that gas and try to get more liquids out of it yet, but for now, We've just done in a, a three-phase separation on the inlet side. Water off the bottom, hydrocarbon layer in the middle, gas off the top. The condi that comes out of here, or the condensate that comes out of here, is right at its bubble point. It's just been in contact with the gas. So if we let it flow down and we take another pressure drop, we'll get even more gas off of it and and do another round of that whole liquid separation. So we can go through a, both a high pressure and a lower pressure separator and separate the liquids from the gas. We get this big chunk of condensate. We have this whole condensate layer now. Cool, now we have to figure out what we're gonna do with that. The issues are a little bit more complex than it seems at first. If we take that fluid and we make it colder, so if we lower the temperature, then we'll push more of the light ends. We'll push more of the things like propane and ethane, the light hydrocarbons, as it gets colder, they'll go into the liquid phase. If we increase the pressure, more of this light stuff will go on the liquid phase. So we want to find the right temperatures and pressures to just get the optimum amount of those. If we make the system colder and we increase the pressure, we'll push more butane to the condensate side, but we'll also get more pentanes and heavier stuff too. So we gain production by making it colder and by making it run under higher pressure. Increase the pressure or lower the temperature, increase the pressure, we're gonna produce more liquids. Production is good. We sell liquids by the barrel, so we want to make more liquids. The problem is the people who take those liquids away, the guys who are buying them, they don't want this light stuff. They want it to go away. It has no value to them. They would like that stuff to all be up in the gas phase side. They don't want to pay for that. Not too much of it already, they say. So the, uh, they want that condensate to not have too much butane in it, to not have too much um, lighter ends in it. And so because of that, the, so if you're the seller, you want to be over here. If you're the producer. Go, man, I want to run this thing as cold as I can at as high a pressures as I can and make as much liquids as I can. If you're the buyer, oops, I'm sorry. If you're the buyer, you go, well, I don't want all that light end stuff. It makes makes my pumps cavitate, it doesn't flow down pipelines very well, it causes me all kinds of issues. So the buyer wants you to run at as high a temperature and as low a pressure as possible because he says, I want to get rid of all that butane. But if you get rid of a bunch of that butane, I get rid of some of my pentanes with it too. So now as a producer, I just lost volume. So between the two people, between the pipeline guys and the producers, or the midstreamer and the producer, there's got to be some balance there. And what they do is they try to say, well, I'm going to give you a specification. I'm going to tell you, you can only give me so much butane. And now you can do anything else you want, but I only want so much of your butane. 
So it becomes this balancing act. We said earlier on the inlet separator side and the, on the condensate stabilizer side, we could adjust pressures and temperatures to change the balance between the butanes and the pentane plus. And so we can, if our inlet composition stayed constant, we could find the optimum temperatures and pressures and we just run there all the time. So when you talk to a lot of operators, they say, no, oh, no, I just run my separator on temperature and pressure control. That's great, as long as your compositions don't change. Because if the stuff coming into the plant suddenly has more butane in it, more light ends, your set points are all gonna change. So now we need to find a way of, how do I adjust my set points? How do I figure out where I should run? So there's a reason we wanna do this. There's a value to doing this. We have that feed that comes in and it goes into the stabilizer. And if we can optimize the operation of that stabilizer, we can meet all of our specifications, which is the key thing, because we're gonna pay penalties if we don't. But we can meet our specifications while increasing our product volumes. This gives us dollars. We increase the product volume. Every extra meter cubed of condi I produce a day right now is 250 bucks. So if I have a 4,000 cubic meter a day condensate stabilizer and I make it run 1% better, it's 40 more cubic meters a day times 250 bucks, it's $10,000 a day. It can be big, big dollars if I can optimize these things. But there's other values to it. If I optimize how much goes to the liquids part, I put less gas up over here. And now I don't need to use as much energy for compression. The big facilities that Encana built up in Dawson Creek are the largest single electrical consumer in Northern BC. Huge amounts of electricity for these big electric compressors. So now you go, well, if I can reduce the amount of energy I'm putting into compression, I save money on my electricity bills. Good, love that. Also means I put less heat. I don't have to reboil as much. So now I put less energy into there for reboiling. If I'm using my sales natural gas for reboiler energy, well, all of a sudden I'm putting more natural gas to pipeline as well. So I picked up some dollars here. I picked up some dollars here. And if I use less energy and I use less energy here, I reduce all my greenhouse gas emissions. So now I change my carbon tax credits. I change or how much carbon tax I have to pay. So there's advantages to this right across the operations. So we're gonna put up a poll right now just to see how many of you guys are actually in the business here of running a gas plant and looking at condensate stabilizers. So when we run these things, there's a set of specifications that the pipeline people look for. And I'm not expecting that a lot of you are gonna be familiar with these specs, but I just wanted to bring them up and so it'd be interesting just to see where you guys get to with this. So I'm gonna give you a couple minutes to look through this. There's a couple of questions here um, and then we will uh, we'll take a look and, and see what everybody gets for it. I think it's, do you want to run out? You'll have this, there's an office right back over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jason's in there, he'll tell you. Insight 2018. I answer these on a couple of computers, so we'll get uh, I'll get the answers in there a couple of times. Try to wait as to where I want it to be. And just, just so you're aware, Chelsea, too, I'm expecting that there may not be a lot of people that have answers for these ones. So 
Um, I'm okay with that. Hey, Phil, can you look at your phone for a quick second, please? Oh, uh, sure. Okay, everybody, so we'll give you just another few. People are still answering. Yeah. So if we can give everybody just a few more, maybe another minute. As those ones are answering, I'll just talk about this a little bit. So the reason this is relevant is because it, it's a custody transfer agreement that happens between a producer and someone who's going to receive it. And in that agreement, they set specifications on... Um, on things like what density of product they're going to be allowed to move in their pipeline and what butane levels or what vapor pressure levels, they may set any one of a number of specifications. So often a specification on sulfur content. And so based on those specifications, it determines what we get paid for our product. People will think that all condensates are created equal and they're not. Some condensates are light and clear and beautiful. You can just about run your lawnmower on them. And the other ones are like crude oil. Uh, I've had a, one of my clients calls it crudensate. It's so thick and dirty and waxy and full of sand and clay and bitumen that it's really difficult to process. So there's different prices paid for the different materials. How are we doing there, Chelsea? We're good. Well, we can probably end this poll. If anybody else wants to get their answers in real quick, guys, we're going to end this in about five, four, three, two, one. And can I share these results, Phil? You bet, please. Okay. Another few guys in the biz. Um, so reference density for condensate. So Density is a measurement of, you know, how much, um, how many kilograms would fit into a cubic meter, or if I had a barrel of it, how much would it weigh? And the reference density for condensate is indeed 750 kilograms per cubic meter. So what they'll do is if you're producing a condensate that's lower density than that, they'll pay you extra money. And if your condensate is denser than that, then they'll say, well, actually, you're going to pay a penalty to move that down my pipeline. So they're going to take a measurement all the time of your condensate, see where you are on those density numbers. The other thing that they look for, though, is what they refer to as the deemed C4 minus. And it's a weird name. Um, so by C4, C4 means butane. And what they mean when they talk about C4 minus is they mean butane and all the hydrocarbon molecules smaller than that. So the minus part is the propane, the ethane, and the methane. So we used to talk about back, I think, around 2013, we used to just look at how much I-butane and N-butane is in there. But now, we want to know all about the lighter hydrocarbons 
And because these ones are more bubbly, they're lighter, um, they will come out of solution easier. They create more problems for cavitation and pumps and things like that. They put a bigger penalty on them. So the actual answer for this is that when they calculate DMC4 minus for a pipeline spec, they multiply the butane, the ethane, and the propane content by three, and then add it to the total amount. Sorry, did I do that right? Methane, ethane, and propane, yeah. Multiply that by three, and then add it to the butane numbers. So there's a big penalty here. That factor three thing, that adds up to a big penalty. I get a bit of propane in there. It's worse than having a lot of butane. So I want to figure out how to get the propane out of my conduit. Um, so you can see this one, we pretty much got like an equal distribution. Everybody was going to, I'm not really sure what number it is, what, you know, or where I should be here, but it was actually the one right there, you know, the one that actually did get almost the highest, 26%, um, is the right answer. We have to take the ethane, add it to the methane, add it to the propane, multiply by three, and then take that number and add it to the total butanes. This is certainly true. You get a credit. Sorry, I didn't move this guy on my screen. here. We do get a credit if it's under 750. So this is true. We get a penalty if it's over 750. So it's, this is true. So the correct answer here is that both of the, or the best answer there is that both of the above are true. And you can see that that's the one that most people agreed on. And we got the last one right too, so that's great. So when it comes down to the butane content, this is false. We actually get a penalty if it, we actually get a credit, or sorry, let me make sure I don't get that wrong. If you're under 5%, it's no benefit to you. If the, if, if the person buying your condi says, oh, God, you guys are only 3%, they don't give you any extra money. If you're over five though, you pay a penalty. So now it becomes really beneficial to run as close to five as you can. They're not going to give me any benefit if I make my condi really good, but they're going to make me pay a penalty if I'm too bad. So I'd rather push as many barrels out as I can, run as close to 5% and stay, I want to keep my butane below 5%, but as close to it as I can. kind of the where I want to be. So neither of these are true. They, I don't pay a penalty if I'm under five. I pay a penalty if I'm over five. And I don't get any credits under, under any cases. So it becomes really important to know my operating point. If you're running your condensate stabilizer and you're putting 3% butane in your pipeline, and you take that up to 5%, you just added 2% more volume. Two for every 100 barrels you were producing before, you're producing 102 now. So you just got two barrels for free by running your stabilizer different. Okay. All right, we can take that poll down, Chelsea. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's a number of different condensate specifications, sulfur content and things like that, but two of the most important, the one that they drive a lot of the penalties on, are this DMC4 minus number that we said is three times the ethane plus the propane plus the butane, or ethane plus the methane plus the propane, multiply by three, add it to the butane. And it has to be less than five liquid volume percent. And penalties are incurred if we go too high. So we wanna keep this below five, but if we can stay closer to 5%, we get more production. So that's where our, optim our, our, our opportunity for optimization comes in. The other part though, is that we wanna be less than 750 kilograms per cubic meter. So we wanna have our density done low. And this is one of the problems in the Montney, the stuff up there is thick and viscous and heavy for a condensate. In the US, they call it crude oil. What we call condi up in Northern BC is crude oil down in the US. Um, so there's a penalty incurred if we get our density too high. And these two things fight each other. The more we boil the butane out, the density goes up. So 
Pushing the butane out, we can get our density to go, our, our, our density goes higher, we pay a penalty there. Keeping too much butane in, we pay, pay, pay a penalty for having too much butane. So it becomes a real playing point. Now, how do I optimize this? The ideal thing would be is if I had an analyzer that could measure how much butane is there, how much C4 minus is there, and density all at once. To optimize this, we're gonna to have to adjust temperatures, perhaps recirculation rates, perhaps pressures, to optimize our production of condensate, push out more barrels of the best quality stuff we have. If we do it right, we minimize our energy consumption, and that means lower reboiler temperatures, lower volume to compression, less energy utilization. We have a bunch of advantages there. And this would all be easy if things didn't change in our plants. But the optimum stabilizer set points for those pressures and temperatures change as things change at the inlet separator, and they change as the composition of the fluid comes in. So we want to be able to measure composition. So to optimize these, there's a beautiful picture of the, one of the plants up in northeastern BC on a sunny day. Um, thanks, Gord, for the picture. Um, to optimize these, it means that we have to have measurement of the chemical composition. And when we think about measuring composition, what we usually think about is, let's use a chromatograph. Chromatographs are great analyzers for doing chemical composition. And they are fantastic devices. There's only one thing though. They generally like to work with a clean sample. They generally like a sample that goes into that tiny little injection valve and doesn't plug it. And so when we're in a sample from the bottom of, a, of an inlet separator or a condensate stabilizer, again, you gotta think about what happens. My fluids come in, stuff drops to the bottom, gas goes off to the top. Where does all the dirt and the sand and the clay and the bitumen go? They all drop to the bottom. And that's where I take my condensate off. So that sample at an operating gas plant is always dirty. And the condensates up in the Montney are really have a lot of heavy hydrocarbons in them and they're really waxy. So it's like trying to make this stuff flow through tiny little tubing in a gas chromatograph and it's full of wax. Doesn't want to flow. So we have a whole bunch of issues that end up to leading really high sample system maintenance and difficulties in getting these things to actually operate well. So when we think about working on a chromatograph, you know, we have to realize this is a very nicely done one, pretty clean looking oven for it, but it's got all this tiny tubing. You'll see all this eighth and 16th inch tubing. And when we get things into that, like bits of sand, bits of clay, bits of bitumen, they just plug off. They just have issues. Gas chromatographs work great on gases. When we start pushing them to be using liquid samples, it can be problematic. Again, this is a really clean one. When we start sampling liquids, we have a whole bunch of other issues as well. There can be a big volume tied up over here at the probe. Often that'll go over to a vaporizer if we're gonna to try to vaporize this condi. We have lag times and delays trying to get into the vaporizer. The condies there are heavy, so it doesn't vaporize well. Because it doesn't vaporize well, we put coalescers in there to try to get rid of some of the liquid droplets that didn't get vaporized. Well, now I just bias my sample. It took the heavy hydrocarbons away. So I bias, I've had a, done a bad job of vaporizing it. I took a long time getting there. I biased the sample by, um, by letting things get knocked out. I may go through a really complicated sample conditioning panel after that, more tiny tubing, and then not all GC ovens are made very nice. They're difficult to maintain. So we have these issues that we would think about. So we'd like to think about, is there another way to do this? Is there a better way to do this? And this is one of the things that we had the opportunity to work with Fluoron back in 2015, 2016, when they started to say, well, what kind of analyzers are we gonna put in this plant up north? And one of the potential solutions that was considered was to use 
was to do real-time compositional analysis. You know, updates every 30 seconds, fast analysis, using a near-infrared spectrometer. Way faster than a gas chromatograph. Updates data every 15 or 30 seconds. Why is speed important? I can tighten my control loops. I don't have to wait for everything to lag and slush around and go, oh, well, 15 minutes ago, I should have turned the heat up, but do I need to turn it up now? No, I don't have to worry about that. I can do that almost instantaneously now. So this gives us better control. We can measure at line pressures and line temperatures. When we go back and we look at sample systems like this, every place along here, we'll have pressure drops and we'll have temperature changes. And whenever we change the temperatures and pressures of our sample, they can change phase on us. We let that pressure drop happen in the wrong place. Bubbles of propane come out of it. So again, you know, imagine this is now my bottle of beer and I take the cap off, all the bubbles come up. I lower the pressure on it. Same thing happens in my condensate. I lower the pressure on it, bubbles come up. The bubbles are the things I'm supposed to be trying to measure. They're the methanes and the ethanes and the propanes. So I don't want to have phase change along the way. So if I can stay at the same pressure and temperature as a the process, then I don't phase change my sample. So now I have something that's exactly a replica. I have a representative sample of what was in the process pipe. Spectrometers let us run through big diameter tubing. You know, Instead of using something like 8th inch or 1 16th inch on a lot of conventional type analyzers, we were going to run everything on half inch pipe or two. And so now, if we have waxes that are going to lay down on the walls, doesn't plug off our tubing. If we get sand in there, doesn't plug off our tubing. Are you, sir? And we might have no, and typically we can do all of this with no moving parts. And once we don't have moving parts, and once we don't have things that are going to plug, we don't have much maintenance. Now, we may want to add other things into that. We may want to automate grab sampling. One of the things that we do in a custody transfer agreement, nobody believes each other's analyzer. I'll pick on Gary because he's right at the top of my screen. Gary's sending me con selling me condensate, and his analyzer says he's on spec, and I'm buying condensate, and my analyzer says he's off spec. When you have one analyzer, you have a measurement. When you have two analyzers, you have an argument. Somebody's got to settle the argument, and it's always the lab. So you need a way to get a sample. Whenever you think you've got off-spec product, you want to say, I want to be able to pull a sample right now. I don't always have an operator there to do it. So automated sampling can help us grab a sample when we want it, and composite sampling can be used to say, what was the long-term average? If it's done well, we, have, we can minimize the efforts it requires to do sampling and build a very repeatable sampling process. So there's a bunch of new technologies that came around here. And so we can individually or combine these technologies and really revolutionize how we monitor product quality. We put these online infrared analyzers in, and we take real-time measurements of things like crude quality or condi or NGLs or gases infrared analyzer, and we put an automated sampler around it, some cylinders that are ready to be filled, and a PLC ready to control it, and say, now I can do my measurement, and I can do my lab measurements all at once. I'm going to talk a little bit about near-infrared spectroscopy, because a lot of people aren't familiar with it, and specifically, we're talking a little bit about JP3. This is a company out of Austin, Texas. This is really how Insight came about. I'm a spectroscopist by trade, physicist, was consulting with these guys back in 2013 as they were developing this new spectrometer, and they're doing all these fancy things in the oil and gas patch in the States. I said, how are we going to bring this to Canada? So that's what we did, is we worked with them and brought this up to Canada. We commonly think of the visible spectrum going from blue to red. And those are different wavelengths or colors of light. If we go beyond the red, we get into the infrared. So the infrared light just means it's redder than red. It's beyond the place that we can see it, but it's, it's, it's moved out to longer wavelengths. And there's some fascinating things about it. 
we put a sample of crude and when we go and tell people, I'm gonna measure the chemical composition of your crude oil. And I'm gonna do it by shooting a beam of light through it. The first thing they go is, if you see my crude oil, you're not getting a beam of light through my crude oil. It's jet black. And that's true. Crudes and condensates, they absorb, they take away all the light. This, this curve is measuring how much of the light gets taken away. They take away all the light in the visible. So you look at one of those and you go, oh my God, there's no way I'm getting light through that. You won't get visible light through it. But as we move, whoops, as we move along the spectrum, as we, um, as we move out into these infrared regions, the amount of light it absorbs drops off. And it drops off, there's a couple little bumps in there. And then we get out to this cool region over here. This region over here is where all those molecules start absorbing light again. And they absorb light differently depending on which molecules are there. If it's propane, it looks like my hand like this. And if it's butane, it has a couple extra bumps in different places. So now I get these different shaped absorbance curves. You know, this one might be propane. Let's say that one's C3. And this one down here might be C4. Um, they have different profiles to them. They have what spectroscopists call, they, everybody says, they each have their own fingerprint. So we can look at the, how much light gets absorbed at different wavelengths. And from the shape of that curve, we can identify which hydrocarbons they are. By how much of it gets absorbed, we can quantify what hydrocarbons are there. So between the colors they absorb and how much light they absorb, we can figure out which hydrocarbons are there and how much of them are there. This technology using infrared spectroscopy to make measurements in the hydrocarbon industry has been around for decades. Almost every refinery uses one of these for blending gasoline. How much butane can I put in my gasoline? Well, I could go and run it on a chromatograph, but that's gonna take me five or 10 minutes. And instead I'll use an infrared spectrometer and I'll figure out my blend ratios fast. Works great. Gasoline is a really clean product. It's usually done in a refinery and there's like 30 technicians walking around that refinery. There's lots of guys to maintain it. The analyzers they put there are often what are called FTIRs, Fourier transfer infrareds. They have moving parts, precisely aligned mirrors that have to move and rock back and forth. And if everything stays perfectly aligned, they make a fantastic measurement. You can do that in a refinery. It's not so easy when you say, you know what, I want to go up to a little blending skid. I want to go to a locked unit in Fox Creek. I got no technicians up there. I got nobody to maintain it. It's going to be in a probably a dirty environment, someplace where you can probably see a lot of vibration and now not so easy to do. So there have to be some technological changes to allow this to happen. One of them was to make a better laser or better light source. And so one of the things that this company in the US was working with were these things called broadly tuned lasers. Lasers have a lot of advantages. They're bright. Punch a signal through crude oil, really easy when you have a laser, got lots of light to work with. They're reliable. These are built for the telecom industry. They're designed for use for pushing data over fiber optics that you put on your oceans. Don't want the things to break down, so now you want a really reliable light source. So remember one of the things we worried about was maintenance. Got no maintenance guys, I got a reliable light source. And they're really bright. Tuned, tuned means I can change what wavelength it works at. So I can map this whole shape out. I can get that whole shape by changing the laser wavelength to measure how much light it absorbs. So I got these fancy patterns, but what do I do with them now? Wasn't so bad when I'm doing gasoline. Gasoline's a pretty stable product. Now I'm on a pipeline and guys are putting light sweet down it. They're putting heavy sour down it. They're putting condi down it. Product composition's changing all the time. I need a better brain. I need better abilities to look at the numbers. What have we seen in the last 10 years? Huge changes in pattern recognition. You know, your phone looks at your face and says, oh, I know who you are. It's okay to do that. Hey, Siri, oh, I'm over here. When my wife was in computer science, 
Her AI prof said she, that they doubt that computers would ever, full, ever fully comprehend human speech. Of course, all of kids' toys do it now. So we've taken that ability to take a pattern and a waveform and turn it into actionable data. Turn it into something we can actually use to do something with. And chemists have taken the data and come up with a whole field of science that they call chemometrics. How do I take the patterns that I see in spectral data and run it through these pattern recognition algorithms to turn those patterns into things like chemical composition and physical properties? So all that's really cool. So now we've got a better light source. We've got a better brain. But now we've got to put it onto a product that's not very easy to work with. So now we've got to have something that we can flow that fluid through that's not going to plug and not going to get damaged. So we have a device that has half-inch ports. It's got a CRN for 1,500 1, pounds. So it can go on a 600-pound ANSI class system. You shoot the light beam through these synthetic sapphire rods. Sapphire is the second hardest thing next to diamond. Transfers infrared light really well. Sand and clay don't scratch it. Perfectly polished. They, uh, do I have one here? Thought I did. <laughs> Lost my props. Um, so now we have a device we can have fluid flowing through it, and it doesn't get plugged, and it's, uh, doesn't get damaged by high H2S, by salinity, by clay, by wax. So now we change the whole way we're going to do measurement. We're going to go into a pipe and we're going to find some source of differential pressure, orifice, control valve, pump. We only need a few pounds. Give me three PSI, a, DP, a, a, a delta P. My direction of fluid's coming this way. My pressure is higher on this side. It pushes it up through that flow cell back down into the process. My entire sampling is done. Mount this as close as I can, you know, within three meters of my measurement point. Being close means the fluid that flows through it gets in there fast. It gets in there fast. It, uh, it's a fair rod. Thank you. Thanks, Monty. When I talked about those synthetic sapphire cores, these are the ones that go inside there. So they're perfectly clear, just like glass. And synthetic sapphire rods, as things flow past the surface, perfectly polished stuff doesn't stick to it very easily. Can I just let everybody know that if you oh, yeah. pop your cursor over the center line of your um, screen you guys there's a vertical little toggle you can actually stretch this over so you can see feel bigger and see what he's showing you guys you can sort of zoom in if you're interested but that's basically a machine they grow a sapphire crystal and then they machine the sapphire crystal to put the edges into it sapphire is extremely stiff and hard it doesn't it, so it has great tensile strength so that's how we get to 1500 pound crns with it you know it holds pressure really well optically clear um, and again, doesn't get scratched by surfaces. That's why Samsung and iPhone and those guys all went to Sapphire windows on their uh, phones, because they don't scratch. And just another note, Phil, you're scheduled to start questions in two minutes. Am I? Oh. But if you want to, um, just let, you just let us know. Oh, you're right. Yeah, I'm going to run a little bit late. Sorry. Um, so, so now we can flow through that cell. We mount that flow cell someplace, close to the process. And we take an analyzer, we take the brain, right? This is where the smart part is. We take that spectrometer with the laser in it and all that computing power and we put it someplace else. MCC building, control room, wherever. Fiber optic shoots a laser beam out through the flowing fluid and brings it back to the analyzer. Analyzer does its smart thing, measures an infrared spectrum, gets that whole spectrum, runs it through those fancy pattern recognition algorithms and says, oh, I'm going to tell you what your C C1 through C9 plus is. I'm going to tell you what your vapor pressure is, tell you your API gravity, tell you your cloud point, your pore point. What, there's a bunch of things we can model from the infrared spectrum. The spe infrared spectrum. <coughs> the beauty of it is 
that the brain is smart enough and the spectrometer is good enough that we can run a second set of fibers over another one of these cells. So if we're going to go into a gas plant, we might say, well, I'm going to put this one over here at the deethanizer. It's my C3 plus stream. C3 plus. I'm going to put this one over here at the condensate. That's my C5 plus stream. So now I make two different measurements in different places in the plant. I can do up to four different measurements points with one analyzer. The US, they've got a ver they're putting a version out that does eight. We haven't put any of those in Canada yet. If I'm doing a little blending skit, I might only want one stream. So we have three different versions, different number of sample points. Here's what an analyzer installation ends up looking like. Condensate stabilizer sitting right over here. Put a one meter by one meter uh, box out beside it. Inside the box is that infrared cell. A little flow uh, switch to tell us we have flow going through it. Pressure temperature transmitter go right back into the process. So flow is you can sort of see two insulated lines comes in and goes back out. Sitting outside in the middle of winter, there's a heater in the bottom of the box. Over in an MCC building, they put the analyzer. So no dedicated analyzer shelter, no building for it. And they bring the fibers in, they bring all the electrical connections in, the analyzer just sits there and does its thing. Modbus communications back to the DCS. So if we're gonna put in a GC, we always think about big analyzer buildings. Here's another one, here's a little single stream unit just mounted inside of a, a blending building. So they've got pumps inside there and they say, oh, I'll take a slipstream out, run it over to the analyzer, bring it right back into the system, make my measurement right there in the building, no analyzer room. So when we compare these, if we look at infrared spectroscopy, we measure right at the process, whereas with a GC, we'll transport it to some place remote. It's that transportation problem that we can run into pressure drops and we, uh, with liquids and we get bubbles, we get phase change. We keep everything at the same pressure and temperature as a process. We assume the process is single phase. When we transport it to a GC, we may have phase change there. Flow through half inch pipe as compared to eighth inch tubing, put no filters or regulators in here. Those are things that plug, those are maintenance items. So what we want is we want to just flow through that cell, come back out. Because of the small tubing and things like that, we often need redundant filtering. We go through all these features, but I actually want to show more pictures instead. Um, talk a bit about condensate stabilizers. Again, so what we want to do now is we want to control how much heat am I going to put in? If I'm going to do that, I want to make a measurement out here. I want to know, well, am I on spec? And am I exactly on spec? Am I exactly 5%? Because if I am, then I'm going to make the most volume. So here's how this runs. People always ask, well, how do you do on a measurement? You know, how does it compare? Whoops. Um, now there's kind of the numbers comparing a lab results. So these are samples that are pulled out and taken to a little remote lab, taken over to Maxim, as compared to the online analyzer results. And you can see we hit pretty close on the IC4s, pretty close on the C3s, pretty close on the NC4s. Our DMC4s are really close, except for perhaps the middle one. Those are three different condensate stabilizers. Three different measurement points, all running out of the same analyzer, 30 second updates on the C4 minus. But we're not just doing the C4 minus. We're actually doing a complete C5, C6, C7, C8, C9, C10, C11, and C12 analysis, all at the same time. Full chemical composition of the condensate done nearly in real time. Same thing on deethanizers. We want to adjust those research plates. There's a C2 to C3 ratio we want to hit. Deethanizers, any other frac tower. We're always one that can control research rates and temperatures. Look at the results on the bottom. Deethanizer bottoms, lab result 0 0.33, infrared analyzer 0 0.26, lab 0 0.97, infrared 0 0.96 on the IC4, NC4 3.41 to 3.6, lab C4 minus and JPC C4 minus is almost the same. 
We can use this for crude and condensate blending. We do vapor pressure and condi. And just because of time, I'm going to move a little bit fast here. Happy to go back if anybody asks a question. We put the first one out within Canna in 2016. That was the tower gas plant. Every gas plant that Tower or Canna put in since then has this technology on the liquid side. Every C3 stream and every C5 plus, plus stream. Sierra, first one goes to Josephford Terminal. We run in parallel with their existing GC and their existing online vapor pressure for a year and show them that we can get the same results with far less maintenance. People talk to us about putting $50,000 worth of parts into their GCs a year on streams like this, plus maintenance time. We, base, we run on a crude blending skid and nobody touches it for nine months. Um, all the gas, Harmattan, Pamina, this should, Verison should say Pamina now, Height has a number of these, Turvita, Green Court, Vermilion at North Portal, Paramount and Fox Creek, crude oil blending applications. How much butane can I put in my crude? I don't know my vapor pressure when I put butane in my crude. Real-time vapor pressure analysis. Oops. We'll include these with automated grab sampling. So over here is this infrared cell. Is measuring product quality. Oh, I just saw an off-spec product. Sends a signal over here to the PLC. PLC says, fill one of these floating piston cylinders. I got a sample I can take to the lab now. This is really important. When you go and talk to guys like Max, and we've got, probably got some lab guys on here, I know they registered, they'll say, one of the things, there's two big problems we have in the lab. Guy doesn't pull the proper sample, doesn't do it the right way. So you send three different guys out in the field, they all pull the sample differently. What we do is it's all run by the PLC. This becomes the brain now that says, I'm going to do this the same way every time. So we capture that sample and we go out and read things like CCQTAs or uh, API 8.2, documents that tell us what's the proper way to pull a sample. And then we build that into the code, build that into the valving infrastructure around it, and make it so this thing does the same thing every single time. HS and E advantage. I don't have to send a guy out to pull a sample. I don't have a guy out there with sour condensate, with high pressure LPG. I don't have a guy touching any of that. I do this all under computer control. Guy comes out and says, okay, I'm going to take these four cylinders out. These ones are going to go to the lab put four new cylinders in and I'm done. Of course, we'll make, you know, a panel like this is not inexpensive, big control valve on it, fast loops. It's a big system. We'll do these as simple little panels. But we're doing, quoting one right now for somebody who says, I just want one cylinder that I can trigger remotely. I think guys put nasty stuff down my pipeline in the middle of the night when nobody's there to pull a sample. So I'm gonna put this thing out there and trigger it with my cell phone so I get my samples in the middle of the night. All of this can be done quite easily. PLC control, automated control. Okay, close. Um, composite sampling. Composite samples give us a big average sample. So one of our clients came to us and said, we want a composite sampler that has CRNs on it, that's fully customizable, can be built in any size, different configurations, and meets all the requirements of API 8.2. API 8.2 is a American Petroleum Institute document on how to properly composite sample. So we build these composite samples, take an average of what flows through the pipe for a day, a week, a month, compare that to the specifications. So this is a building I particularly love to show because it's got that infrared analyzer over here. It's got automated sampling over here, controlled by the PLC. This is a toluene flush, so condensates can be really waxy, and you worry about the tubing building up with wax. So we can say, well, if you start losing flow, back flush it with toluene, and flush out the system. And now we have two composite samplers also sitting over here. So kind of a sweet building, and uh, and it just shows that we can take all these technologies and put them together for measuring things like com uh, condensate quality. So I'm going to conclude here just by saying that 
Optimization of condensate production is a complicated thing because there's a lot of variations in composition, pressure, and temperature. Those inlet variations on the separator side change everything that goes over the stabilizers. And now we need to figure out different operating points. If we can put online and precise measurements, then we can actually start to control the production quality, increase production volumes, reduce emissions, reduce power consumption. And then we can add in things like automated grab sampling for end online analysis at the same time, composite sampling in there, and use that all to make measurements and do the things that we're supposed to do. That which we can measure, we can control. And control leads us to make better money. So I just want to say a huge thank you to all. Uh, I know I ran a little bit over, apologize for that. Of course, I didn't have a picture of you guys, so I just picked a random picture off the internet and called these people my new friends. Um, but uh, again, a big thank you to all that attended. Of course, none of this would have happened if it wasn't for GPAC. Um, and so I want to thank the Gas Processing Association of Canada. They arranged this whole thing and brought this all together. And I'd like to thank Chelsea and her team because they helped a lot with the, um, sorry, my little screen went off behind me. There you go. Um, they helped get a lot of our video stuff, getting Zoom working like this so we can hold a big meeting, keep all you guys here, and, uh, and also, of course, helping us with hosting. So Chelsea, uh, Jeannie, and uh, Jen, thanks so much again. You guys are always great. Um, so yeah, open for any questions if anybody's got them. Thank you, Phil. Did you want to do this last poll? Oh yeah, we're getting one poll right at the end. That's right. Thank you. After, que after questions or before? Right now, because oh. some people may have to go. I ran a bit late. Sorry. Right. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. All right, and go ahead. Oh, people are so quick on this poll. Everybody must have lunches to go to. Yeah. <laughs> cool. I'll see I was satisfied, sure. Oh, there's some great questions lining up here. God, this is going to be fun. <laughs> it's going to be fun listening to me try and pronounce them. <laughs> That's why I wrote them over to you, just in case. They're awesome. Uh -huh. Okay. All right, everybody. So it's been at the same number for a bit now. We'll give everybody another maybe five seconds to do this, and then we'll end this, and we'll switch over to the uh, Q&A period. I think I did this as not an anonymous. Yeah. I, is it anonymous? I can't remember. This is, I'm just going to end it. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Well, this weird. We'll just get some results of how people thought. Just be for art. So, yeah. in case anybody has bad things to say about us. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. JP3 guys at the bottom. So, if I get any questions wrong, I see Steve and Greg are right at the bottom of my screen. So, if I get anything wrong, I know who can pipe in. <sighs> Okay. All right, everybody. So three, two, one. All right. Thank you. Those are two polls, all for us and all for our information. You guys are wonderful. Thank you so very much. Now, questions, answers. Um, I just want to make sure that I have them all. Again, everybody, um, I will start listing. We've been keeping track of your questions from um, the beginning of this presentation. So I will start down the list and please feel free to pop off mute and clarify what it is that uh, you'd like to ask. Also, all I have on here is everybody's nicknames. So some of these are gonna sound really weird. And if this is you, again, please feel free to jump off mute. Um, if your camera's not on, pop your camera on. Phil can see you. And so you guys can have a real conversation if that is gonna be easier for everybody. 
So starting at the top, also some of these may be a little bit out of context because they were relevant at the time, but we'll just see what we can do here. Um, okay, is this spec C4 and density applicable for other countries? As far as I know, this is only good for Canada. That comes from Kumar. Yeah, and I, as I know certainly what the specs I was referring to are Canadian specifications. In the US, a lot of times, or other countries will sometimes put it as a vapor pressure specification. And actually, even on the Enbridge lines, they look at vapor pressure. And on the Pamina lines, they look more at C4 minus. So the specifications are applicable, but different in different places. Um, you know, again, there's a couple of JP3 guys that do a lot on the US side, so they would probably know more there. Um, but it's a, it's a very common thing to have to either look at the butane content or the vapor pressure for a lot of these fluids. And in the US, there's a lot of the, the Permian oil that's produced is really light and it's a lot like our condensate. And so they put heater treaters in and they're doing the same thing. They're trying to drive the butane out to get the vapor pressure down so they can put it into a pipeline. Awesome. Kumar, is there anything else that you wanted to add to that? Awesome. Okay, cool. Um, next up we have from Tom Corey. How does the analyzer determine which model is to be used on the process? How much can the process change for one model? Yeah, I'm going to back up because there was an interesting comment there just by made by Morgan before that. It wasn't really a question, but a comment. Just want to okay. mention it. Just that um, Morgan put one in there. They saw a pattern recognition on IR data used for octane number measurement and blending gasoline 202, 2002. That's what I was saying. They've used this technology in refineries for a long, long time. The problem has been trying to take that technology that was being used and make it into something that was rough and hard. You can put it out there with guys who've got thumbs as thick as my wrist working on it, and they can keep the thing up and running. So now Tom's question. Hi, Tom, how you doing, man? Um, so Tom's question was... Did you it? Sorry, did you want me to repeat that question or do you see it? I see it now, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Online, uh, oh, sorry. Um, online analytical options for to test. Oh, well, no, it's not, no, it's not Tom's one. Sorry, it went past it. Tom Corey, how does the analyzer determine which model oh, okay. is used on the process? Yeah. How much can we? Pro how much can the process change for one model? Yeah, it's a good question. So it's one of the things that um, is one of the things that's always addresses a challenge for what are called inferential type analyzers. So we look at how the spectrum changes and from that infer what's going on in the process. In order to build a good model, you have to have had some data that covers the range of the process. So when we go out to a plant, let's say, or let's go say a, a crude oil blending skid, we'll say, well, take your base crude, put in a half a percent butane, take some lab samples, let us get some spectra, put in 1% butane, take some lab samples, let us get some spectra, and let's flesh this model out over a range of butane compositions. So these kind of models tend to interpolate well. If you measured out at the high vapor pressure point and you've measured at the low vapor pressure point and you have some points in between, it works really good on the points in between. Try to go extrapolate into a completely different operating range. What you usually have to do, get some more lab samples, add some more data into the model. The beauty is, is you can update and improve these models over time. Brilliant. Okay, cool. Did that answer the question? Tom. Sounds like it. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. Feel free to jump in after your question's been answered too, guys. If you get to the mute button late or something, we're still here for you for another little bit. Okay. Um, Density K, cool. Jay Cowan question. Are there any on, so this is from Jay Cowan. Are there any online analytical options to test for volatile merge? captains. Thank you. In, <laughs> in the condensate stream. Yeah, great question. Good. So one of the problems up in the Montany again is it's really a sulfur rich field. And there's a lot of mercaptans in the condi that's out there. And so guys like so the pipeline guys have put specifications on what's called volatile mercaptans. And you pay a penalty if there's too much. Or they shut you in. But there isn't really a good online analyzer to measure it. So what it means is the guys who are operating out there, they're injecting chemicals to try to get that mercaptan number down, but they don't know how much to inject. So they just inject more. 
I don't want to be off spec. I don't want to be too high. Being too low, there's no penalty. So I'll spend more chemical. So the chemical costs go up. There is an online analyzer from a country, company called Metrom. They were, one of them registered here today. Um, there's an online analyzer. Sorry guys, it's like a chemistry set on wheels. It's a big, like lots of moving, lots of liquids that move around and you do a few things and put a big purge unit on it and it will do mercaptans in a condensate stream or diesel and things like that, so. Awesome, thank you. The only one I know of right now. Okay, cool. And then from Devang, uh, this person has two questions. Uh, the first is, can you explain in detail how model can be prepared accurately? Sometimes laboratory analyzers can be used, but if they are wrong or having error, then model of FTNIR also having error. How to ensure model is error free? Yeah, I mean, it's always the problem, is, always the difficulty in any type of modeling analyzer is it's only as good as the data that goes into it. So one of the first things that you have to assure is that you have a really good lab. The analyzer is going to try to learn to predict the lab results. So if your lab doesn't get you good results, um, then you're going to have issues with the modeling as well. Cool. And then another, sorry, Phil, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Okay. And then even in some application, FTNIR analyzer comes without sample systems and only fiber optic probe. Mm -hmm. That's the end of the question. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, again, you know, I mean, there, there are guys who will, and I thought, I think there was one later about, or earlier about, or later about, you know, do we have to build our own models? A lot of people approach this differently. Um, some people will say, well, I'll just sell you the analyzer and a probe and you figure out how to make the measurement and you build your own model. And that can create issues because again, now you gotta be sure you got good lab samples and you have good chemometrics guys to do it. Our approach has typically been, we put the analyzer in, we go out and pull all the lab samples we need, we get spectral data, we continue going out and pulling more lab samples until we have a model that maps the process space that we wanna work in. Awesome. Just have a, I think I'm missing one, one second. Um, okay, and then from Captain, can we, can fast loops work effectively with these applications? Yes, yeah. Detect H2S as well. Oh, sorry. No, no, you go ahead. What was the second part of that? that can, okay, yeah. can this be used to detect H2S as well? So the infrared technology we're using does not do H2S. Um, it's, uh, it'll do H2S at high concentrations in the gas phase, but um, the H2S absorption bands are weak. We don't see much absorption from them. So we don't do H2S in like liquids or condies. The other question was about using fast loops. Yes, you can use a fast loop. We prefer to put the measurement head as close to the process because it incurs less cost than putting a fast loop in. But we've done applications where people already have a fast loop coming to a building and then we just make the measurement, right? at the fast loop. Great, okay. A um, couple questions from Yoshi. I have two questions. First, and is there any preference in the instrument to guarantee the three PSI pressure drop? Second, is three PSI a reference number of the pressure drop required by the IR? Depends no, on- No, so, I mean, three PSI, I, I was, what I was really trying to say there more was that we don't need a lot of pressure drop. The more pressure drop there is, the more difference there is between our sample point and our return point, easier it is to get flow to there, right? We just basically put, make sure if we're returning to a low pressure point, we make sure to put the pressure reducing device, whether it's a valve or a thin run of tubing downstream of the analyzer. So the analyzer stays at a higher pressure, liquids are, are packed together and bubbles don't wanna come out. And that way we make our, our measurement all in the appropriate phase. Okay, and then there's an iPhone question. I don't have a name, but can we measure aromatic? Oh yeah, you got this one. Aromatic oh. hydrocarbons also. Did you answer that? I did not. Okay. So um, yes, certainly aromatics have a really good absorption band in the NIR. And it's a really common measurement that gets done at refineries. They'll often do octane number, total aromatics, total olefins. Um, aromatics have a unique signature in the infrared. So yes, they can do aromatics. Great. And there is a spec for aromatics and pipelines, but we often don't, um, it doesn't require an online analysis usually. It's just a monthly thing. 
Okay, and from the same um, from the same person, is there any cross interference issue, especially of water? Uh, there potentially can be. Yeah, water is nasty. Water has got a big infrared signature, and so we can. Um, it's got a strong absorption band, so we can detect the fact that water is there and say, when we used to do this, one of our clients, when they're starting up a new plant, we would look at their spectra because we can get into the analyzer over a uh, cellular modem link, and we look at their spectra and give them a call and say, you guys, you got problems with your inlet separator again. There's a lot of water in your condi right now. Um, so yes, it can be measured. It can be an interference. Interference is for, in a lot of these gas processing applications, it's not so much interferences that comes up as it's large product uh, variability. Like right now, and when the markets kind of crashed and went crazy, a lot of people changed the operating set points of their deethanizers. So they go into ethane recovery mode or not in ethane recovery mode. And it really changes the chemical balance there. And we have to go out and get more samples for the model. Fabulous. Okay, it looks like that is all I have in the chat. If I missed anybody, could you please draw attention to that, everyone? Um, or if you, if there's any further questions that anybody wanted answered or to ask Phil, you're welcome to pop off mute, ask for yourself, or again, just chat me and um, remind me of something that I missed. There was also a lot of commenting and messages that I haven't um, addressed because there weren't really questions from what I gathered, but if I was incorrect, please jump on. Phil? Yes. How do you calculate your VCPR4? So we, so that's a really good question, actually. Thanks. So because, so the reason it's a really good question is because some people will approach trying to do something like vapor pressure, VPCR4, by looking at the different chemicals that are present and using some kind of an equation of state that says, well, based on it having this much butane and this much pentane and this much hexane and this much heptanes, I'm going to use a mathematical model to predict what the vapor pressure is. The way we commonly do it in the near infrared is we pull lab samples and just get them analyzed for vapor pressure. And we build a model that says, I'm not going to tell you anything about the chemical composition. I'm just going to build a model that correlates when this part of the infrared spectrum goes up, my vapor pressure goes higher. When this part goes up, the vapor pressure goes lower. And so between that, I come up with something that can predict um, vapor pressure often to within, we usually do like on a condi or a crude stream, we're usually around plus or minus three kPa, which is pretty close to the lab precision. We can't really do better than the lab because that's the, if you look at um, ASCM D um, 6377, it's only two and a half or three and a half, two and a half reproducibility, uh, two and a half repeatability, three and a half reproducibility KPA. So, yeah, but that's so we, we build it, build a model for vapor pressure. Same thing we do for cloud point or pore point. We build a model that says, I'm just going to look at the infrared spectrum, and based on that, I'm going to make an estimate of what the pore point is. Great, right, thank you. Yeah, sure, Tim. Thanks. Cool. Well, if there's not more questions, again, I want to thank you all for coming. There's lots of people here I know. I'd love to just touch each one of you and say hi, 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 because I haven't seen anybody so much. Uh, and it's weird doing this of, all, uh, without having a whole bunch of people in a room where we actually get to shake hands afterwards. It would be kind of nice to have people there and go for a drink right now, I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> but uh, it was great having you, and thanks for coming. Uh, any other questions? You sure. can approach. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, Phil. Can I just pop in quickly? There have been a few questions about um, parts of the presentation being shared after. I think um, you spoke about sending an email out to everyone after. Yeah. So, I, think, okay. I think the plan is, and I don't know um, if Sally or one of the other GPAC people would want to comment. I think we were going to do kind of a subset of some of the slides. Um, and also one of the things that I did write a paper that a lot of this presentation was um, based on, uh, both for the ISA in 2019 and the Canadian School of Hydrocarbon Measurement. So I think we're gonna put both of those papers up on the GPAC website as well. So we'll work with GPAC and we will, we're gonna send you out an email pretty soon, just thanking you for being here. And then we'll send you another one with all the links to the stuff that came out of this. 
Brilliant. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, GPAC. Thank you, everyone, for joining us from all over the world. And thanks for your engagement and your questions. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Great seeing you. And uh, any other questions, feel free to contact myself, Scott Glenza, um, or anybody from the GPAC side of things. We'll have to try to help you out. Thank you. Take care now. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Oh.